So finally, here is the RTX 3070 Ti buying guide. I know I'm a bit late, but finally it is here. So let's get right into it. A short explanation on what the purpose of my buying guides are. I aim to inform people on which GPU models have better configured hardware and BIOSes. Sure, it is true that any RTX 3070 Ti should probably perform similarly within a few percent of each other at default regardless of the hardware and BIOS configurations. This is because of the specifications being set by Nvidia. Well, except for maybe a few of the more extreme cards when overclocked. But you are spending lots of money, so being able to choose the best ones that are available and in your budget is always a plus. I always emphasize on the power limits, cooling and VRMs as the most important because the new GPUs these days can boost their clock speeds as high as they can as long as there's enough power and temperature headroom, which makes the boost clock specifications pretty much useless. So the factor that actually affects performance in real life is the power limits and the cooling performance of the cards. This is why Nvidia now makes brands list TGP or power limit specifications for the laptop GPUs, because it really does matter a lot in terms of performance. And this is also why I am quite annoyed that they don't list the DGP on the box of desktop GPUs, where different models from different brands might set wildly varying DGPs that affect the performance even if it uses the same GPU. Fortunately, the power limits can be checked on the BIOS files, which are available on Tech Power Up's GPU BIOS database, as long as someone has uploaded it using GPU-Z. Which is why if you buy a GPU, please download GPU-Z and upload your BIOS file as that'll help me and others when comparing different GPU models by seeing the BIOS files themselves. Now for cooling performance, it is also just as important, as the boost algorithm automatically boosts the clock speeds higher the cooler the GPU is. Not to mention better coolers will usually mean lower noise levels and therefore a better user experience. Also important are the VRMs, which is the circuitry that provides the operating voltage to the GPU and the memory of the GPU. But for the memory, they're pretty much always not really important, so we're just gonna focus on the GPU VRMs for these types of comparisons. The VRMs current capabilities are very important for anyone that wants to overclock, especially if it involves shorting the power monitoring shunts that remove the power limits completely by fooling the power circuitry that it's drawing less power usually called shunt mods. But for people who don't overclock, a stronger VRM will mean it'll be stressed less and will run cooler, which should last longer with all things equal. So let's start with the stock power limits or the TGP, which stands for total graphics power, which is the total amount of power that the graphics card pulls, which for the RTX 3070 Ti is actually pretty consistent. It doesn't matter very much at all. This is probably because the RTX 3070 Ti is pushed pretty high out of the ideal TGP of the GA104 chip that it is using. Considering that the Nvidia reference specifications is already at 290 watts, which is a whopping 70 watts more than the RTX 3070 that uses the same chip, and only 30 watts below the RTX 3080 which uses a much bigger chip, making the RTX 3070 Ti the most inefficient Ampere GPU as it is basically an overclocked RTX 3070 which much faster and much more power hungry GDDR6X VRAM that also contributes to the power increase. With the RTX 3070 Ti, the 290 watt power limiter is mostly already sufficiently high to not cause lots of TGP related power throttling unlike in bigger chip GPUs like the RTX 3080 and 3090s that I've covered before. In this case, the stock power limit doesn't matter as much, but it is nice to see the higher power limits as it gives you flexibility to use the higher power limits or lower it as you need. So this time around, I won't focus too much on the default TGP limits since you can see for yourself the lower end card still has to adhere to Nvidia's 290W specification and the highest power limit card is only the Palette GameRock OC at 330W, with the other cards employing a 310W power limit. If anything, this time around, lower limits might be nice for the RTX 3070 Ti to somewhat regain its efficiency. Although I understand that that comes at the cost of some performance, so not any manufacturer is actually going to do that. In fact, the real limiter to the RTX 3070 Ti performance is more on the cooler rather than the power limits, which is the opposite of many of the other Ampere cards. So instead I'll focus on the maximum power limits. This will be very important for those wanting to overclock as a higher power limit will let a higher clock speed that can be sustained without power throttling, 
Of course, you can also just do shunt mods to remove the power limits just as I usually say, but the maximum power limit also serves to show how confident the manufacturers are in their card's quality as they will usually set it at a level that's safe for their VRMs. Here you can see the vast majority of the recent cards allow the 320 watts to 330 watts maximum power limits, which is basically enough to max out an overclock for the RTX 3070 Ti. Although, I would have liked to see MSI Supreme cards with higher power limits to match its competitors in the same high-end custom card segment. There are even higher power limit cards still, where once you reach 350 watts or higher, there should be no point in doing shunt mods on these cards, as they have more than enough power headroom to max out the RTX 3070 Ti. Considering 350 watts is the same power limiter as the RTX 3090, with almost twice the core count and over twice the GDDR6X memory, so it is definitely more than enough. It is still very interesting, however, to see the ASUS Strix cards with an exceptionally high 380 watt power limit, which should make overclockers and enthusiasts happy as they wouldn't need to shunt mod at all with this card. It's basically already as high as you should need. Now, next comes the VRM current capability of these cards, where a higher current capability means a higher quality VRM that can handle more abuse. Before anything, I also want to warn you of the cards with a question mark at the end of their names. These are my speculated VRMs on these cards since I really can't find any information on them at all anywhere. So if you know any information on the VRMs of these cards or have these cards and are willing to take it apart and show me the PCB, I would gladly analyze it and post an update comment down below. First off, to give some perspective, the RTX 3070 Ti at about 300 watt TGP runs at 1.062 volts which is much higher than other NVIDIA Ampere cards, which means calculating using the equation current equals power divided by voltage, at about 1.062 volts, it will draw around 283 amps, which is sufficiently lower than the cards with VRMs, only capable of 495 amps. As usual, there are still spikes in GP power consumption, and therefore also the current, so extra VRM current headroom is still needed. As an example, the Founders Edition 3070 Ti shows power spikes up to 407 watts in short 1 millisecond burst, according to the review in Iger's lab. This would equal somewhere close to 383 amps of current being drawn by the GPU, which is still very reasonable and comfortably below even the lowest end cards VRM. Then there are cards that can deliver 550 amps from the VRMs, which basically just added one extra VRM stage to the base VRM specification on the reference PCB design. Then there are the MSI Supreme cards at 605 amps, which is surprisingly low for a high-end design and I would've liked to see better here even if it's not super important for the RTX 3070 Ti. Now the Gigabyte Aorus Master is only my speculation when considering the other Gigabyte cards being two steps lower. I am also only speculating on the EVGA FTW3 cards considering the RTX 3070 versions. The Palette Gamerock also has a weaker VRM than I expected when considering they had the higher default power limit out of the other cards, but this is already more than enough VRM current capability. Which makes the cards above this like the 770 amp Colorful Vulcan and the 780 amp Asus Tough pretty overkill, and somehow D still gets beaten by the even more overkill Sotek Amp Extreme Holo and Asus Strix cards. The Asus Strix cards being at or near the top of the VRM charts is something I have always come to expect. But seeing Zotac's card here is also a pleasant surprise, which seems to be the trend with their newer Amp Extreme Holo cards. Now for the cooling performance of the different cards, it is impossible to find performance results on every model as not every one of them gets reviewed. But I did gather the performance results measured by Guru 3D, Tech Power Up, and Hardware Lux who seems to do some of the most consistent and thorough GP reviews most of the time, although I also added eTechnics here, despite their less professional measurements making it unusable in a combined chart. Since they are the only ones that shows the Gigabyte Aeros Master performing well, when the Hardware Logs review showed the possibly defective card since it runs hotter and louder than even Gigabyte's own lower-end RTX 3070 Ti's. I combined the results of the first three reviewers by correcting the temperatures to tech power ups results as they had the most GPUs tested. I did this by calculating the average delta temperature and noise measured on the same cards that tech power up tested and corrected any card that isn't tested with that, which results in this combined graph. If we sort by temperatures, we can clearly see the MSI Supreme X is definitely the winner here, with the Gigabyte cards also performing extremely well here for being a lower end card design than the MSI and even the Palette Zotac and Asus cards 
which is still awesome performers, but just not as well as I expected them to be. Especially for the Asus Trix cards having such a powerful VRM. The Zotac M Holo is clearly behind these other cards, as well as the Gigabyte Eagle which uses a thinner cooler than the other Gigabyte cards. The Palette Gaming Pro also performs identically to the Gigabyte Eagle, while the Inno 3D X3 is a bit behind. The real surprise is the Founders Edition card, which for the first time performs the absolute worst at cooling the GPU by quite a significant margin. This is clearly because Nvidia used an inferior dual fan pull through cooler than the RTX 3080 while having nearly the same power consumption, but also on a significantly harder to cool smaller GP104 chip, making it the hottest and almost the loudest card. Speaking of loudness, if you sort the chart by noise, you can see that the MSI Supreme X again comes out on top as MSI just seems to know how to make great air coolers for GPUs, while being followed by the Gigabyte Gaming OC, which somehow managed this very impressive result, and as well as the Zotac Amp Extreme Holo, both in their silent biases, which is what I would run on a daily usage. The rest of the cards are significantly louder. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone testing the Asus Trix on the silent BIOS, which should be pretty quiet considering the cooling in the performance BIOS that's available. Another weird result is the Palette GameRock OC, which barely changed in noise levels in the silent BIOS but ran significantly hotter, suggesting the fans are resonating and making the cards sound louder even at lower RPMs, which is not something I see very often. The Zotac Ampolo, on the other hand, should be avoided if you want any semblance of a quiet system, as it is definitely the loudest card of them all. Since the RTX 3070 Ti is a relatively tame GPU to cool compared to the bigger RTX 3080 and higher end GPUs with higher power outputs, it means that the performance differences between the coolers are much less pronounced. The thermal bottleneck seems to come more from the ability of the cooler to conduct heat from the GPU core to the cooler, rather than dissipating it to the air. Now for the rest of the cards, which don't really have any reviews on them, I have made this cooling performance tier list as usual. This is to be taken with a grain of salt as these are just observations I made considering many factors, such as the type of heat pipes, heatsink size, number and size of fans, and the cooling performance of said heatsink model used in a different GPU if they have been reviewed before. But this tier list should still serve pretty well to determine how a card's cooler performs roughly to a different one. Just don't make it out as a fully accurate tier list but considering more of like if it's in the same class it'll probably perform pretty similarly. So it seems like the cards with large enough heatsinks basically perform similarly as they have excess heat dissipation capabilities in the heatsinks. These cards are basically the S tier coolers with all the top of the line triple fan 3 slot coolers from different manufacturers. If I had to pick the best one though, the MSI Supreme card seems to have the outright best coolers, which isn't surprising considering they have the largest ones. Then there are the A-tier coolers, which are still very well-performing coolers for the RTX 3070 Ti, and pretty much as good as it gets without going overkill. Next there are the B-tier coolers, which are mostly narrow design heatsinks but still having triple slot thickness. They still perform very well for the RTX 3070 Ti, so they should be fine for most people's usage. For the C-tier coolers, they are triple fan narrow coolers which are only two slots thick, They'll be good for compact builds that can only fit 2 slot GPUs, but should still perform pretty well. The only bad coolers are the dual fan ones, like the Founders Edition wannabe colorful cards and the actual Nvidia Founders Edition. It seems that these smaller dual fan coolers just don't have enough heatsink mass and heat pipes to effectively pull away the GPU heat fast enough for a high heat density design like the RTX 3070 Ti. These weird flow through dual fan designs also usually suffer from worse PCB component cooling leading to hotter memory and VRM temperatures. Lastly, let's put the cards into a tier list, with the cards also being ranked from best to worst. I factor in all the pros and cons of each card to place them above or below another card. This is really just my personal opinion on the different models of the same GPUs. So you can also interpret this as I would always pick a higher tier cards over a lower tier one if I were to buy one myself. At the top of the list would be the S tier cards, with the Asus Rix OC at the top but not the non-OC version, as it has a much lower stock power limit which in my opinion shouldn't be on a card as overbuilt as the Strix. So instead I placed the Zotac Amp Extreme Holo as the second place due to its powerful VRM and cooler. Then the Palet GameRock OC as the third place due to it having the highest stock power limiter which is neat for anyone not wanting to overclock and the colorful Vulcan OCV for its large cooler and powerful VRM. 
Then there are the non-OC Asus Strix and Palette GameRock, which are the same hardware-wise as the OC versions, just with worse BIOS power limits. Realistically, if you get those, you can just flash the OC BIOS onto those cards, and it'll perform like the OC versions. Next up are the MSI Supreme cards, which has the absolute best coolers for the RTX 3070 Ti, as it seems to be basically just as big as the RTX 3080 and 3090 Supreme cards. Extremely overkill coolers that's great for those looking for low noise operation and cool temperatures. The only issue I take with it is the relatively weak VRM, although it is still more than adequate. The EVGA FTW3 cards would be after the MSI cards, mostly because even though it is worthy of the S tier, it is in any way significantly better than the higher tier cards in any category. And I'm not certain on the, what the VRMs are like, so I'm just putting it here as a safe bet. The Gigabyte Aeros Master actually looks to be a contender for the best cooler with the MSI Supreme X based on the Etechnics review. But that is literally the only review that is available for it and there are no comparable models from Gigabyte with reviews that I could reference from. So I have to reserve it for being the last of the S tier since there are not enough reviews on it to make a solid conclusion. Now for the A tier, these are more reasonable cars that use less comically large coolers and only dual 8 pin power inputs. These models makes a lot more sense for an RTX 3070 Ti than the S tier if you ask me. Starting with the Asus Tough Cards, which basically has a cooler almost as good as the Strix version, but with cut down VRMs and lower bias power limits. More fitting for people looking for a nice RTX 3070 Ti and not really an extreme one that needs to be the best one at everything. The Gigabyte Vision and Gaming OC cards are also surprisingly great performers for the RTX 3070 Ti, with power limits on par with any other high-end models and coolers that give the top cards a run for their money. The only downside here is the reference spec VRM, which is nothing amazing, but also nothing terrible. This is a similar situation with the Galaxy cards, but their cards just don't seem to have as good coolers as the Gigabytes. Now for the B tier cards, it starts with the Zotac Amp Holo, which I would have put on A tier if it weren't for their cooler being so noisy. Then there are the colorful cards, which has VRMs and power limits on par with the A tier cards, but just don't have as good a cooler. The Inno 3D i Chill looks to have referenced VRMs and power limits, but with a decently good cooler put on it. The MSI Gaming X Trio then is another case of me not being sure of what to make of it, for not having a single review on it, which is kinda bizarre for a graphics card. It should have a cooler worthy of the A tier cards, being MSI's large triple fan cooler, but the VRMs and the power limits are a mystery to me, so I just considered it being probably reference spec. It should be still better than the Gigabyte Eagle cards due to the larger cooler though. Then we have the pretty boring C tier cards, where these are basically just narrow heatsink, triple fan, triple slot cards with reference PCB and power limits. With the exception of the EVGA XC3 cards, which are dual slot but a bit wider than some of the cards, usually leading it to better performing than the triple slot cards. These C tier cards are solidly in the OK category. They will work perfectly fine for anyone looking for an RTX 3070 Ti, but don't expect anything amazing out of them. Lastly, there are the D tier cards, which are actually cards I would avoid altogether. This is the first time in a while I actually recommended avoiding some cards, but these dual fan designs are just not up to the task of cooling a relatively small GPU core with a massive 290 watt TGP, leading to high temperatures and fan noise. I do find it interesting how bad the Founders Edition is compared to the other cards. The VRM is mediocre reference spec, and the cooler is nowhere close to the triple fan cards, which is kinda bizarre and also kinda disappointing. When you consider the other Founders Edition card from Nvidia, usually always have a VRM that is super capable, and at least a cooler that's somewhat decent in doing the job. But that's not what you find here in the RTX 3070 Ti, so I would avoid the Founders Edition card at all. I won't pick a best all round GPU or anything like that this time, because, well, most of you can't really pick anyways, although I would hope that would change in the near future, so I would use this GPU buying guide by choosing the higher ranked cards of whatever options you are presented with. Therefore, you get the best cards that you can get. But yeah, that is it for this video. I hope I helped you in some way and that you learned something useful from this video. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions and leave a like if you like this because dislikes can't be seen anymore anyways and well, subscribe if you want to see more buying guides like this. Thanks for watching.